The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. This is good news. There's time to repent and, and join with the right team. Um, just so, uh, it's on one of my ending slides, uh, just so I don't forget. We have the Zen Project User Summit in New York this year, September 15th. It's a one-day affair. It's all of 79 bucks. It's probably some of the best Zen Project information you're going to get all year. I encourage you all to consider putting it on the calendar. It's on a Monday, so that means if you want to do like the long weekend thing and check out Manhattan, uh, it works pretty well. So uh, I encourage everyone to do that. As I'm the one organizing it, it's like, please, please come. Uh, but it actually should be really good because we're just about to publish the schedule and we've got all sorts of uh, interesting talks going on that one. Um, how many people intend to stay till Sunday? Excellent. I think that's more people than stayed till Sunday last year. Um, I actually have two talks on Sunday uh, that I would love to encourage you to show up for. The other Zen talk is uh, Zen 4.4 uh, Features and Futures. That's the one after lunch. Um, that's got a lot of decent information in it. And then I have a more general open source talk in the morning called uh, Geek Empowerment, the Real Heart of Open Source. And I encourage everyone to show up for that one because quite honestly, I think there's something going on in the community we need to be aware of. I'm not hearing anyone else talk about. And uh, it could be devastating to us as a community if we're not conscious of what's going on and do some, make some changes. So I encourage everyone for that. So my, why don't we just get going? Um, this is the advanced security features of the Zen Project Hypervisor talk. So the obligatory who the hell are you slide. Um, I'm a guy with a really big mouth. Uh, and so that's my job, to have a really big mouth. Um, I technically get a paycheck from Citrix. But if you're having a VDI issue, I will look endearingly into your eyes, pat your hand, say there, there, and there's nothing I can do about it because quite honestly, I have very little to do with anything that's traditional Citrix. My job is to work with the Zen project team itself. Uh, I do open source. And uh, I've got a history that dates back to 95. I used to be a columnist at a couple of magazines. Maybe once upon a time you saw something like that. Anyone remember the Linux show? The original Linux show? God, I feel old. OK. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know, that was a webcast that went on for, I think, seven years. That was actually a tremendous time. Um, and I've written a lot of stuff, which goes along with having a really big mouth. So in, the, in this presentation, we're going to first deal just a little bit about the whole notion of security in clouds, because that's something that's on a lot of people's minds, and this fits into that. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about the Zen security tools that are available and some of the security features. And um, you know, none of this is particularly difficult. The whole trick of it is you have to know that the security tools exist and you have to make the decision to use them. In most cases, using them is not hard, but you have to decide. And that's part of what this session is is to get you aware of what's out there, get you pointed in the right direction so you can use them if you choose to, and, and get, get the ball mo uh, moving. We're going to be covering those topics you see there. By the way, these slides are already available on zenproject.org. If you go to the presentation section, you can uh, download it. I think it's listed as Linux Fest Northwest, because I gave this talk recently uh, at that show. Um, same set of slides. <coughs> so let's just talk for just a couple minutes about the whole notion of 
securing a hypervisor in a cloud. How many people are working with clouds? Just show of hands. How many people are thinking of working with clouds? How many people are fearful of working with clouds? OK. Um, the stuff I'm not going to be talking about is not cloud specific at all, but it's just it's one of those topics that comes to mind for a lot of folks. Zen Project, for folks who don't know, is a type 1 hypervisor. In just a minute, we'll discuss exactly what that means. Uh, it was actually had the very interesting uh, function of being built for a cloud environment before the whole term cloud was even coined, um, which is a, a really neat thing. And it's got a number of security features that we're going to cover that you just have to decide to use. Now, the whole notion of cloud security is the 800-pound gorilla. I mean, how many people have had the discussion of, you know, about this or that, about clouds? Oh, clouds are insecure. We can't, we can't have our data out in the cloud because, you know, that's insecure. And uh, we're going to talk about that in just a second. But, you know, that's one of the big FUD issues when it comes to cloud adoption right now is the whole security thing. I think the second biggest issue when it comes to cloud adoption is this whole notion of change. How, you know, uh, not too many, no cloud advocates in the room. You, you, you can tell a cloud advocate because they've got, like, stripes running down their back where they've been beaten soundly when they go into their IT operation and say, we need a cloud. And especially if you've got a, a, an IT operation that uh, you know, has guys with like, you know, as much gray hair as I do, you've got to remember that in this industry, the mantra up till you know, the 90s was that in IT, change is bad. The whole idea of IT was stability. When you left at night, everything that was doing all that it was doing would do the exact same thing when you got in in the morning. That was the ideal. That was nirvana. If something changed in the night, that meant something broke. That meant probably someone got a phone call at 3 AM. That meant someone's job was probably threatened that unless it's up by beginning of business, you, know, you may not have a job in this organization. Change was a horror in IT. And when you got a new box in, what would you do? You'd beat the box to death until all the change was out of it, and you had the run book assigned to it, you had the policies assigned to it, you had the software assigned to it, so everything was known. So by the time you turned it on, it did what it was supposed to do, and it just sat there. And you could walk down the racks you know, in the old-style old data centers and, you, and just eyes closed, like that's the HR server, this is the payroll server, this is the database, and you didn't even have to look. Because you knew where everything was, everything was in its little box, everything did it what it was told. Along comes cloud, and it's like, hey, we want something that changes automatically with the, with the wind. We want something that will move and groove with the, with the business. Well, what a lot of younger folks particularly don't realize is you know, when they go into an old school IT organization and start saying that, it's like telling your saintly grandmother who goes to church every day that you've become a Satanist. It's like telling the PETA person that you like stomping puppies to death. It's, you are in, you're not just doing something un, uh, uh, that's not normal, you're doing something evil because you're embracing change and everyone with gray hair in IT knows that change is evil. So that was part of the the, the real pain that a lot of people had to go through uh, if they became cloud advocates, and I had to deal with that role for quite some time. But we're not going to deal about that specifically, but the second big one is security in cloud, and hopefully we'll be covering that today if you're having to wrestle with that notion. The truth is that security in IT has always been a problem. So this notion of, oh, in the cloud it's not secure. Well, that's actually a fairly true statement because your data not in the cloud is also insecure. It's just that you've ignored it in most cases. Because frequently the brand solution has been the firewall. Oh, we've got the firewall. If we've got the firewall, we are secure. Uh, let me tell you a story that, that will date me, as if I need any more dating than I've already done. In the era before the internet, I worked with a very large media company that uh, 
uh, used to deal with security in this way. When we had to dial in to check out the site, they say, just make sure that modem is unplugged after the dial-in, and that will keep us secure. We're secure because they can't get in through the modem. And on the surface, that sounds like decent logic. But then you add a couple other pieces to this picture. This was a company that used to thrive in acquiring other companies. When they do the acquisition, they bring everyone into the room, and they say, 50% of you are now fired. Other 50% of you are going to do the work of the guys who just left without complaining. If you complain, you'll be fired, and we'll hire back the guy that we just fired who used to sit next to you because he now wants a job. <coughs> so you have a group of people who are used to being treated like meat. They are cattle. They're not happy. Add to that the piece of the picture that all these various sites that they had located throughout the country all had the exact same password structure. So the application in Des Moines had the exact same password as the one in Portland is the one down in Florida. And these people talk to each other. So if you get one disgruntled employee somewhere in Wisconsin calling his buddy who is, uh, who's around in New York, say, by the way, the password to payroll is blah. You have a problem. Did they recognize the problem? No, because they had turned off the telephone. And that's part of the problem that we have with security thinking in old IT. We have the firewall. Well, that's great. The firewall can help stop one type of exploit, or maybe more, coming in from the outside. But there are other exploits. There are other possibilities. All of this comes down to security thinking. So this whole notion of security through obscurity, we're going to lock it in the back room, is dead. Let's just get that off the table right now. What we're going to deal with <coughs> excuse me, is security by design not by wishful thinking. And that means you don't rely on your firewalls. You don't address one area of your security saying, well, we've got this locked up, and then ignore other areas of security. You need a, and you certainly can't say, we haven't had the problem before. In this industry, that's not even a valid statement, for crying out loud, because the world looks different today than it did a year ago, let alone five. You have to have security by design. And that's the way that Zen Project comes about. We have a security model by design, by intent. Uh, the designers foresaw a day, and you can look at this paper, and like I said, these slides are online, so if you want the link, just you know, go to zenproject.org, grab the presentation, click the link. <coughs> You've got this paper out there which was actually written in the late 90s, saying, at some point, we want a flexible infrastructure that responds to the need of the organization. And that's why we need this thing that's a hypervisor. And it's got to be able to withstand the pressures of that style of organization. So we have a hypervisor that was actually designed with this problem in mind. Let's talk for just a minute about the basic architecture, because not everyone is an architecture freak. Most people have jobs. Um, this is a textbook picture of a type one bare metal hypervisor. You know, you've got the, you've got the hardware on the bottom, you've got a hypervisor layer that sits right on top of the hardware, and then you've got your VMs sitting on the top. Very simple sort of concept. Now, that's not the only model of hypervisor that's out there. It's also called a hosted or type two. Type 2 does it a little differently. We've got the hardware. Now we've got a host OS, and the hypervisor functions are within the host OS. And the VMs sit on top of it. That's closer to what KVM does, and some other hypervisors do it that way. Um, which is better? Whichever works best for you. It's simply two different ways of approaching the problem. 
Um, and uh, frequently you'll find that one fits better inside one organization than another. But it really is depends on your, your application. But those are the two, uh, two basic uh, architectures. Now, Zen is a type one with a twist. So here is your textbook type one that we just had up before. This is what the Zen architecture looks like. Pretty similar. You notice all the pieces are there. What's missing? The device drivers and models. That goes into a thing which we call DOM0 or control domain. Why would we do that? Well, it's really quite simple. How many people have been working with Linux for, say, 15 years? Show of hands. Okay. You remember the days when you would go out maybe to the local computer show or something, you'd come back with that new piece of hardware. It's like, yeah, I've been waiting to do this. And you plug it into your machine and you boot it up and it's like, crap, no driver. Uh, so you either go out looking at fresh meat or source forge, looking for a driver, or maybe you try to upgrade your Linux distribution or something like this, try to get that driver in for the hardware. <coughs> well, it turns out that by now, Linux and the BSDs have a pretty good handle on drivers. It doesn't make any sense to reinvent the wheel and keep those drivers down in the hypervisor layer, so you're constantly having to upgrade your hypervisor to get the latest driver. So the thought is we'll just leverage the driver power that's already there in the control domain and use that as the means of talking to the hardware uh, where we need to. So that's really why the device drivers and device models um, are, are up in the control domain. Now let's just take a look. Let's do a little breakdown further for the sake of our discussion today. And this is uh, a little bit more exact uh, picture, not quite as pretty, of, uh, of what's going on. Notice that we have a fully virtualized um, uh, HVM uh, VM over here. And that talks to the device model, which is QMU. Um, just so people are aware, yes, Zen in for fully virtualized mode uses QMU, but it doesn't use QMU's virtualization. It only uses its device emulation. <coughs> That's what it's there for. We do not actually use its virtualization capabilities. But it does a real nice job of imitating devices, so that's, that's good for that. That's in fully virtualized mode. In para-virtualized mode, we have our own drivers uh, having to do with netback, netfront, block, block back, and, and block front. And so that's the image here. And we're going to go through a couple, uh, a couple different examples using uh, these, these two styles of VMs. For a moment, first is the whole notion of what is security thinking. We're going to actually deal with threat models. We're going to think through some possible threats. We're going to try to evaluate what can happen from those threats and how badly you can, uh, you'll be affected by them if they're successful. And then we're going to look at some tactics uh, to fight those threats. There is no magic bullet. And that's, you know, like I said, there was the firewall thing. We have the firewall, therefore we're secure. No. Magic bullets are dead, too. So what we need to be thinking about is defense in depth. Defense in depth thinking is, well, you know, if you think of an old medieval town, you know, you've got the town, you've got the marauders, they're coming in. They say, well, how can we defend the town? Well, we'll put a moat around the town. Well, that's pretty cool. So they dig a moat, and they got the moat there. But then some marauders come up, and they've got boats. Well, what are we going to do with mar marauders with boats? Well, let's build walls on the inside. So we've got the moat, we've got the wall. Well, that's good, too, because then the marauders have to have the boats, then they have to scale the walls. Well, then you bring in the archers, you know, so you can fire the arrows down. So you have level after level after level to fight the invader. That's the sort of model that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about individual tools that you put together in layers to defeat the attackers. Hello. OK. Uh, just uh, for the sake of conversation, 
We're going to have a fairly basic hardware setup, figuring two networks, one for control and one for, uh, for data. That second line, very definitely written by an engineer. It means that you have uh, hardware with virtualization extensions, i.e. any server built within the last 12 years or so, something like that, um, for the sake of discussion. Uh, we're going to assume the very default sort of configuration of having all your network drivers in DOM and domain zero. <coughs> and then the power virtualized and the hardware virtualized will use the defaults, uh, default settings as well. And then we'll talk about how you can make it better. So let's take a look first about an attack on the network interface. This is a very common one. Uh, in fact, I remember probably about 10 years ago now working with a customer that was dealing with something similar to this, only not even in virtualization. And the interesting thing here is most of these attacks we're going to talk about are not virtualization attacks. They're attacks that even if you're not virtualized at all, you're still dealing with right now. <coughs> Excuse me. The network attack's a big one. I worked with the customer, as I said, and they had, uh, they had just gotten a whole bunch of new servers in. You know, racked them, stacked them, getting them ready to go, ready to power up. Then the boss uh, reads something and realizes that the brand new shiny nicks in all of these servers have exploits in them. And the proprietary companies that were providing the drivers hadn't provided updates yet. So they're insecure. So he takes the corporate credit card and gives it to Bob or whoever on the IT staff who runs down to whatever local supplier they had and comes back with arms full of boxes of older style NICs which were known to be secure. And he and the rest of the uh, uh, data center staff had a wonderful time over the weekend pulling every single new box that they had just racked and stacked pulling out the brand new shiny nicks and putting in the ones that they knew they could secure. And a wonderful time was had by all. This is a very common problem through the years. So we have to uh, be wary of this. And in this case, let's assume that we have a rogue domain. You know, how do you get that? Well, any number of ways. If you're a hosting company, you get them all the time. Somebody buys a VM from you and puts nastiness on it. I mean, it's different in internally, but there's any number of ways you can have a rogue domain. And let's say that rogue domain then is going to try to attack your network stack for nefarious means. So that's what the picture looks like. Now, how might this happen? Well, they may be looking for bugs in the hardware driver, maybe bugs in filtering and bridging. Um, maybe even in power virtualization, they might be trying to attack NetBack. NetBack being the sort of little socket that's used for network traffic. NetBack itself is like really, really simple. So it's exceptionally hard to do anything in NetBack. But we have to be intellectually honest and say, well, it's possible. So that's why we have it listed here. So this is what the attack uh, situation looks like. And as I said, in hardware, this could be devastating. Um, the strange thing that most people don't necessarily realize is that in a hypervised situation, you can actually defend even better than you can in hardware. Because you're not going to send Bob out to the local computer mart to get nicks and ruin his weekend. So let's say that. Uh, that it's been compromised. Now, the red areas show what a compromised situation might be. They managed to get into the, all the networking drivers, somehow take that over. They managed to take over the guest network as a result. It's a bad situation. If they're in that situation, they might even take over the control of domain zero, because it's all part of the kernel structure. And that could lead to the compromise of the entire system everything that's on that hypervised host. <coughs> so what do we do? We introduce the notion of a driver domain. Now notice, all these things in yellow are no longer part of domain zero. They're in their own isolated domain. That isolated domain is non-privileged. That isolated domain 
has no access to things like passwords, databases, even disks. Why would your, why would your network domain need to look at the disk? So you can isolate all these things into its own domain. So when the attack comes from that rogue domain, it's attacking something that has very little of consequence attached to it. <clears throat> As I said, it's unprivileged. It provides driver access and is very limited in scope. So it, it really doesn't have much going on there. Doesn't even have, a driver domain doesn't even have access to things like Bash. You don't even have utilities. Why would you have utilities in a driver domain? <coughs> so if compromise, compromising happens, a driver domain is lost. So this is what the end, end situation looks like. Now, is your control domain at risk? No. It has nothing to do with the control domain. Is your hypervisor at risk? No. They haven't reached the hypervisor. All they've managed to do is to basically disrupt network traffic. Now, if you're in a cr cloud especially, what happens if you disrupt network traffic? Well, just about every cloud I've dealt with, that sends off alarms in short order. And they say, let's reboot this or let's restart this because something's wrong. So they have managed to go in and win a victory. They've disrupted your network traffic. But in the cloud especially, that victory Victory is short-lived. Could be a matter of a minute or two. What have they received? Have they received any valuable data? Maybe your proprietary plans, maybe your passwords. No, because they don't have access to any of that. All they've done, they've gone from compromising your entire host situation down to being an annoyance. They've gone from causing a major infection to causing flea bites because of the use of driver domains. <coughs> and what's more, if they want to go further, now they're going to need to try an entirely different attack because they got the driver domain, but that didn't give them what they want. So now they have to figure out how to manipulate a domain that has no utilities, like we said, has no access to disk, has none of this and somehow do it, do it before the software decides it's time to restart because something's gone wrong with the network. So it's, it's, uh, it's made their job all that much harder. Now, how do you do this? This is a quick, quick walkthrough. All you need to do is set up the appropriate VM with the appropriate drivers. There are hot plug scripts available. You give the VM access to the things it needs access to. In this case, it needs the, uh, the physical NIC. And then configure the topology the same way that you would within the driver, within the control domain, which basically amounts to something that looks more or less like this in the configuration file. And that's about it. You can find the full walkthrough here on this wiki page, like I said. These slides are available online at uh, zenproject.org, so you can uh, go to the link there. But that's it. It's not a really difficult thing to employ, but it's exceptionally powerful if you think that you've got a potential weakness in this area. <coughs> Excuse me. Now let's take a look at the PyGrub bootloader. Loader. This is a situation where in a power virtualized situation, we see that we have a thing called PyGrub. Now, as the name sort of implies, this is a grub, a, a bootloader that works uh, within the power virtualized world. And uh, we see that, it, that PyGrub, by default, re resides within the domain zero environment. PyGrub is a Python program which does what Grub does. Um, it reads the VM, uh, the VM file system. It parses the grub.conf, and it does what Grub does. That's basically it. It's Grub for a particular, <coughs> particular PV application. So in the case here where something has happened to this disk, and it can now attack PyGrub, someone's inserted some sort of 
uh, infection or whatever. It could attack PyGrub, which could attack the entire domain builder tool stack, and in essence, uh, threaten con uh, the control domain. <coughs> it may be exploiting bugs in the system parser or the menu parser, domain builder. You know, so it's, uh, you know, any number of, uh, of, of basic exploits that could be trying to leverage. And this is what it looks like when it's done. The red area indicating infection. Well, you know, you're, you've just lost control of your system. So there's a couple ways we can combat this. One is called using fr fixed kernels. Now, if you're using... If you're using the hypervisor in a production situation, you're probably already doing this. You're not allowing people when they boot up to pick their kernel. That's basically all this means. Um, and that's a very reasonable way of dealing with this. So because there is no PyGrub involved at all, um, there's no chance to infect the actual system. Now, that means that your host administrator then has to be re uh, responsible for picking the kernels, et cetera, and keeping them all up to date. Okay, in production, that makes sense. But that may, may not make sense if you're running sort of more of a lab environment. You want the people to have the opportunity to pick how they want to boot. So instead, we use PVGrub. Now, note that PVGrub, rather than residing in the control domain, actually resides within the target VM. And it sits on top of a mini OS, just a minimalistic operating system, which is just enough to get the thing to boot. So it's just a, a grub that works directly in the guest context. And it's basically the equivalent of, of a, a BIOS boot, but in a PV context. <coughs> As a result, if there's something out there to infect, all you'll do is you'll lose the guest domain. But if it was infected disk, it was already lost already. So basically, nothing new has happened. There is no longer a threat to the control domain. Now, how do you use PV Grub? It's actually fairly simple. Make sure that you have the image. You look for something of that sort out there. That's where it normally lives. Debian and Sless and a few others, it's already pre-built for you. Oh, excuse me, I mean, it's less you have to build yourself. Other ones are, are pre-built, like in Fedora. Um, it's not difficult to do, quite honestly. All you have to do is then add the appropriate bootloader uh, parameter, and there's the wiki page below. And that's pretty much it. It doesn't take much to, uh, to get this to go. And in fact, there's been some work inside the latest release so that... Uh, that PV Grub is actually, I think, going to be, if it's not already now, part of the actual Grub tree. So, um, so it will be 100% compatible always with Grub because it is Grub. It's, uh, it's part of the, the Grub project, and it's just targeted uh, appropriately for this sort of use. <coughs> now, attacking QMU, as we said, Zen doesn't use QMUs hypervisor capabilities. It only uses its device modeling capabilities. And it does a real good job at that. But as with anything, there may be bugs that someone may try to exploit. And this is the picture we showed before. There's QMU residing in DOM0. And if you're doing full hardware virtualization, you have to use QMU to, uh, to emulate devices. Now, QMU. Uh, as I said, in other contexts, it's used for virtualization, but not for us. There may be bugs in, you know, anything that's emulating. Um, it's all possible. And in the standard situation, that could yield control of domain zero. And that could be a, a serious system compromise. Well, we can get around that by using what's known as a stub domain. It's a small service domain that runs a singular application. Uh, it's kind of similar in concept to a driver domain. It's a little different, but it's the, the basic concept applies. So instead of 
letting QMU reside in, control, in the control domain, we're going to create its own box and throw QMU in that box and use that for device modeling. So what happens if the uh, assault is successful there? Well, you, once again, you take over this little bitty box that has no access to passwords, no access to databases, no access to anything. And the net result is that you have won this very small, semi-useless VM, and nothing of value has been compromised. And now you must come up with an entirely different attack to try to get some to, to whatever data it is that you're actually trying to get to. Now, something we're going to talk about in a couple minutes with both the driver domain and stub domain is the use of Flask. And Flask is the security policy. And when, when you add Flask to either driver or stub domains, you end up with a very tight package that makes it almost impossible to do anything useful with, which is really, really good. <coughs> now, how do you use a stub domain? It's almost identical <coughs> to using PVGrub. You make sure the image is out there. That's where it's normally located. Uh, in SLES, you have to build it yourself, although I've heard that SLES 12 has it pre-built, um, but I'm not sure yet, uh, so we need to verify that. Fedora already has it built. The Debian offshoots, you'll have to build it yourself. You basically add that line to the config and then follow the information on the wiki. That's it. <clears throat> it's not that difficult, but it is quite powerful. Now, there's the notion of attacking the hypervisor itself. You know, every once in a while I read articles <clears throat> that talk about cloud security and stuff like this, and they say, oh, well, you know, people can attack this big field of hypervisor to get into your system. Well, quite honestly, if you look at the way things are structured, with, within Zen particularly, at least, the assault area for the hypervisor is minuscule. It really is. There just isn't a lot to attack. But it's possible. In the 11 years that Zen has been around, there has been one known successful hypervisor exploit, and that was killed years ago. So this is not a, a rich area for, uh, uh, for expansion. <coughs> so how, how could this happen? Well, in the PV area, if you're using power virtualization, uh, it may be some bug in the hypercalls. Maybe that's where they're going. If you're doing fully hardware uh, virtualized area, it could be the HVM hypercalls, could be instruction emulation or other emulation for the various devices, or it could be trying to use something like nested virtualization. So if you have your druthers, stick with the PV area if you're worried about this, because PV area is even smaller than the hardware area, much less of an attack surface. Now, the Zen security modules, also known as Flask, <clears throat> everyone's favorite government agency, the NSA, uh, has been responsible for SE Linux. They're also the ones responsible for the Zen security modules, or Flask. Now, I've heard a lot of people recently, I, I live in the Washington, D.C. area. And I hear a lot of people say a lot of unkind things about the NSA recently. I've yet to hear anyone suggest that they don't know anything about security, however. So regardless of what else they may be doing, this they do pretty well. And uh, the Flask framework was developed to be like SE Linux, except on a level that makes sense for VMs at a particular granularity that makes sense for VMs. So uh, how many people have had aneurysms or close working with SE Linux? Show of hands. The good news is you can have that same aneurysm working for, with the Flask, OK? Because it's the same <clears throat> mind-numbing, gut-wrenching stuff, but it's there. 
So if you need to, tight, to tighten something down into a secure bundle, Flask will do it for you. <coughs> and it even actually restricts down to the hypercall level what's allowed, which is very, very powerful. So you can take Flask and wrap it around a driver domain. Take Flask and wrap it around a stub domain and actually make it so that isolated domain can only do exactly what it's designed for. That's extremely powerful. Now, there is a thing called a Flask example policy. <coughs> and just like with SE Linux, you don't take an SE Linux policy that someone hands you and turn it on in production and say, I hope this works, because it won't. Flask is kind of in the same boat we give you something that looks pretty good, but whether it works for you, you're going to have to decide. So make sure you test it, work with it, tweak it to make it work for your organization. We don't test it as thoroughly as the rest of the system. Say when we have our test days, we have test days during every release cycle. And, and the Flask example policy doesn't get uh, nearly as rigorous a testing because it's assumed that you're going to have to make adjustments anyway. So that's up to you. Um, but it is exceptionally powerful and very useful for things like this. So how do you deal with Flask? Uh, you've got to make sure that uh, XSM is, is enabled. You build the example policy, and then you start making um, the adjustments to fit your environment. And there is a web page that will help you get that aneurysm you were hoping to have by using things like this. Now let's talk a little bit about ARM-based security. How many people are looking at or working with ARM as a future situation? Okay. ARM is actually one of those very interesting things where it's a, you know the architecture that goes anywhere from you know the cell phone, to your car, to now servers. And in particular, these highly dense server situations. Uh, Zen works on ARM and is continuing to be developed on ARM. And it's really a tremendous story from a security standpoint, as well as any other standpoint you want to make. This is what the ARM architecture looks like with the hypervisor calls in, which I think was with the was it ARM v7, I think, added the hypervisor extensions. So this is, this is what the basic ARM tree looks like. Now, how does Zen fit into this picture? Notice that the hypervisor fits right into the hypervisor mode within ARM. Bam. Doesn't need to cross over, doesn't need to change modes. Likewise, kernel space, user space fit directly into kernel and user space within the, within the ARM architecture. This just leaves the device tree. Device tree, domain zero. It covers the device support. That's it. I was talking with uh, Stefano, who's one of our uh, chief ARM guys. <coughs> he, was, uh, he was saying that it was like the ARM architecture and the Zen architecture were implemented from the same document. That's the way it's designed. As a result, it's extremely good for security because while you're in the hypervisor mode, you never have to run into kernel mode to get anything done. You stay in hypervisor mode. You don't need to have that additional power mode. Other hypervisors can't do that. Most of, the, uh, most of the things that are designed for the x86 world cross because they play with that type two style thinking. So that's not present here. So it stays inside the hypervisor mode, it maps, and as a result, you don't have the elevated privileges coming and going. So there is no room for that level of exploit. And we don't need to do device emulation because we can just cover that with the driver in domain zero, period, end of discussion. And we don't have to worry about 
legacy operating systems like Windows that can't be educated as to what's going on underneath because there isn't such a thing really in the ARM world. So it makes for a very tight, hard solution. And that's basically the talk, and I actually have a minute or two left. Uh, as I said at the beginning, we've got a couple of uh, Zen uh, events coming up. The User Summit, which I'm in charge of in September. Please, please, please consider coming. If you're using Zen, it's well worth your time. Uh, the Developer Summit is at LinuxCon in Chicago. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're twisting bits in the Zen world, that's a, that's a good place to be. But if you're a user, please consider the top one. We are trying to rebirth, or perhaps more appropriately birth, a true user community in the Zen world. Zen world historically has been very sort of developer-minded and hasn't necessarily done a really good job of trying to bring together the user community. It's sort of been hit and miss. We're trying to do something about that, and we're trying very actively to bring Zen users together. So please consider uh, User Summit. It's well worth it. I'm going to be publishing a schedule probably in about a week. We've got a lot of good talks uh, that are coming there, and that's like, I think, 79 bucks or something like that. As I said, too, it's on a Monday. So if you ever wanted to like hang out for a long weekend in New York, here's the excuse, you know, show up a little early. Uh, many thanks. Uh, the, uh, first off, there, there is a, a uh, wiki page. Everything's got a wiki page, but there is a wiki page about security. Many thanks to George Dunlop and uh, Stefano Stabilini, who uh, did a lot of the, the background work here. Thank you for that. Uh, questions? Ah, performance as, as, as uh, having to do with like things like drivers, domains, and stub domains. Thank you. I really should have addressed that. That's, I'll pay you afterwards. Uh, the interesting thing about the use of driver domains and stub domains is that used intelligently, it can actually increase your performance rather than decrease it, uh, which is really kind of an interesting thing in the security world that when you lock something down, it actually does better than it did before. The reason for that is, if you think about it, if you have multiple VMs going through, say, one network pipe, well, you know, that could be a log jam. Well, if suddenly you break this thing off into its own little module, there's nothing that says that you can't actually break it off into multiple modules. So you could end up with, let's say, let's say we're, we're talking QMU, so you're talking about device emulation. Instead of having one QMU stub domain, you could have five, or you could have 10, or as many as you need to deal with the number of VMs on your machine. <coughs> you know, this didn't used to be a problem, because when you were talking about VMs on machine, you were normally talking about stuff that you could probably count on your fingers. There is a technology out there now, and if you'll go to the zenproject.org site, and look at Mirage OS, or if you've heard stuff in the press about OSV, there is this notion of a, um, of what's sometimes called a uh, cloud operating system. It is a very, very light OS that, uh, <clears throat> as a result, you can put many of them, and by many, I'm talking about hundreds or perhaps even thousands on a single host. And if you're going to do that, it kind of makes sense that at the hypervisor layer, you want replication of you know, whatever device models or anything else that you may be using. That's one of the powers of using these device domains and subdomains, what we refer to as disaggregation as, as a principle. To be able to disaggregate stuff that is normally in domain zero and create not just one individual copy, but as many as needed, so that if you have lots and lots of VMs running, you can say, well, these 20 are going to go to this one, and these 20 are going to go to this one, or however you want to do it. So instead of actually 
making it worse performance-wise, we can make it better using the exact same techniques that we just showed you. It's a, it's a tremendous win-win situation. It's, you know, once again, it's, it is a security by design situation where someone actually, believe it or not, thought this through <laughs> uh, be, before they you know, throw a Band-Aid on it. Well, no, this isn't about throwing Band-Aids on. This was you know, the result of some really intelligent thinking. And as a result, you can do better implementing these things carefully. It's just that out of the box, you need to make decisions. So you have to look at your setup, and make whatever decision makes sense for security, but also for performance but you can increase both. Uh, other questions? Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, we do have the Zen, Zen Project 4.4 Features and Futures talk after lunch on Sunday for the six people who will actually be staying after lunch on Sunday. Um, if, if you're one of them, you know, please, uh, please consider coming to that. That's actually, got some, we've got some interesting information there. Likewise, the slide deck for that's out on zenproject.org under the presentation section. And I do have a session Sunday morning about uh, geek empowerment, the real heart of open source. It's a straight open source talk. And I encourage everyone, if you're around on Sunday morning, uh, please stop in for that. It will be well worth your time. Uh, that much I can pretty much guarantee. Well, thank you very much, and I hope you have a great show. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.